know, very often, pretty much every day, we have guests on uh, who've got so many letters behind their names and have done so many interesting things and written so many best-selling books and award-winning journals that I can't, uh, you know, really give them a good uh, bio here. We had him on for about 30 minutes last week. He's with us for the rest of the hour uh, today because it's an important subject. Aubrey de Grey, Dr. Aubrey de Grey. And uh, you know what, Doc, before we get into all this, it's best for you just to tell us about yourself. I know you don't like that, but instead of me just going over 20 pages of stuff, what do you think's most important for my listeners to know about you? Sure, I have no trouble doing that. Um, well, I'm a biologist. Uh, specifically, I'm a biomedical gerontologist, which means that I'm interested in the biology of the aging process but with a view to eventually being able to do something about aging, and in, in particular with a view to being able to defeat it completely in the future. I was originally a computer scientist, more of an engineer than a basic scientist, and one thing that has certainly helped me a lot in being able to make a contribution in my chosen field is that I have this sort of um, bipartite uh, background, uh, an engineering training and also a basic science training. Tell us about some of the books and journals you've written. Well, uh, I have a book out that came out about six months ago. It's called Ending Aging, and it describes the technical details of how I think we're going to go about ending aging in the foreseeable future. I have written it very much for a general audience, so nobody who's listening should be scared of buying it. Um, but at the same time, I don't really cut any corners on the science either. I go into as much detail as necessary to show that we really do know a great deal about how we're going to solve this problem. And you head up a foundation that's one of the preeminent uh, groups uh, out there trying to, I guess, think tank all this information together, but also fund uh, some of the research. That's absolutely right. The foundation is called the Methuselah Foundation, and we solicit funds from the general public which we then give out again to researchers to perform important critical path research in universities around the world so that we can hasten the defeat of aging. You, you've got several run... sites. Which, uh, which ones are important to plug? Well, um, it, it's all really within one site, mfoundation.org, but what, there, there are two main parts of the site. One of them is de dealing with the actual research itself in a more abbreviated form, of course, than is present in the book, and talking about the particular research we're funding and what we'd like to fund in the future. The other part concentrates on our other main activity, which is the M Prize, a prize competition that we run, which is simply in intended to encourage researchers to try to break the world mouse lifespan record. And the purpose of that is because mice are sufficiently similar to humans that serious progress in postponing aging in mice is likely to have... Uh, foreseeable biomedical relevance to humans. And they're already living 50% longer. Well, that's not completely true. Um, at the moment, we can get mice to live maybe 40 or 50% longer if we start really early, especially if we... That's what, I, some, that's what I was saying, yeah. If, if, we, if we alter some of their genes before they've even been conceived, so we alter the genes of their parents. But for those of us who have the misfortune to be already alive, the important thing, of course, is to develop therapies that can be begun in middle age and yet have some effect. See, I think uh, that's where we uh, got confused last time. I'd seen years ago, like 10 years ago studies. I'm sure you've seen them too, but uh, and you, you probably re remember the details better than I do, but talking about just with diet mice living a lot longer, you're talking about separately genetically modified uh, mice. That's right. I mean, so basically the genetic modifications that have been discovered so far that make big increases in the, in the lifespan of mice are actually based on the same sort of science as the dietary interventions that were discovered very long time ago, 70 or so years ago. Basically, the genetic interventions trick the mouse into thinking that it's not getting enough food, and it responds by altering its metabolism in a way that has a side effect of slowing down its rate of aging. But the thing about that intervention, um, about the dietary intervention of just not feeding the mouse as, as much as before, is that unless you start it really pretty early in life, it doesn't really have much of an effect. If you start in middle age, it only very slightly increases the life. And we covered that last time. I want to get into another uh, area. Uh, there are those trees in the high desert areas of um, California that they think are thousands of years old, not just the big redwoods but the smaller ones. And I remember reading in some studies a long time ago in college that scientists uh, think that it's brethren lower down that only live 200 years but, the, but, the, but these trees are, are over a 1,000 years, is because it's very low water, very low um, 
uh, temperatures at night, but also, uh, you know, hot during the day. And, um, I mean, is there some type of corollary in plant research to plants that are put under pressure? Uh, there is some, but we have. We, we would be very unwise to read too much into it in terms of its relevance to what we could do for ourselves. No, I understand, but why are those trees then up on those mountains living ten times longer than their brethren down in the valley? Well, there are, there, there are a variety of reasons, including simple erosion and the, the, the vagaries of the weather that you've mentioned. But the reason why we can't read much into it is because in a tree, the cells that are actually alive still on the surface of the trunk and in the leaves and so on are all continuously dividing. I mean, not rapidly dividing, but there is not a single living cell in a tree that has spent more than 20 or 30 years without dividing. But our brain, our eyes, all these key parts, they stop dividing. Absolutely, especially the brain and also the heart and one or two other tissues. And that's really important because a non-dividing cell has much harder problems to solve in terms of avoiding aging, avoiding the accumulation of damage than a dividing cell does. If a, if a, if a cell accumulates garbage, you know, material that is indigestible in some way, and it doesn't know how to get rid of it, but it divides, then that material is diluted out between the two cells. So it can be kept at a constant level within any one cell, and that's an enormously powerful rejuvenating influence. And that also applies to mutations that accumulate in the DNA, for example. You can use selection to get rid of the cells that get the mutations. So the adoption of, well, the, the, the evolution of tissues that have long-lived non-dividing cells, especially the brain, was really the point where we sold our cell to aging. And that's why we need biomedical technology to do something about it. Okay, I mean, putting it in layman's simple terms, uh, and you've, again, he's got peer-reviewed uh, studies, papers by major universities and medical institutions, uh, and, the, and they're saying there's a lot of evidence, I mean, it's backed up scientifically, uh, how are you saying that, that we now know that in the future we'll be able to put it off? And then, as you said last time you were on, then if we can put it off another 30, 40, 50 years, there'll be more advances. Then we know that develop. I mean, what, what is proven? I, I mean, how do we know you'll be able to do this? Ultimately, we know it simply because we know that the human body is a machine. That's really all it comes down to. We don't know how soon we're going to be able to do it. I think we have a 50% chance of getting there within, let's say, 30 or so years but we certainly don't know how long it's going to take, and that's because we don't know enough about the obstacles that we may encounter going forward. But at the moment, we can describe in quite a lot of detail all the various types of damage that the body accumulates as side effects of its normal operation. That molecular and cellular changes throughout life that start even from before we're born and that are initially harmless, just in the same way that it's okay to have a little bit of garbage in your house, um, but that eventually, when they get too abundant, they start to cause real damage. So we need to repair those various types of, go of damage, those, re those molecular and cellular changes. And since we can already describe those, what those types of change are, we can look quite closely at how we might get rid of them. And the, my reason for optimism is that we can describe, not just in general terms, but in a lot of detail, exactly what we need to do and in some cases, we're pretty close to already being able to do it, to reverse those various changes. Uh, I mean, continue. Give me some examples of what we currently know that is working. Okay, sure. So in, uh, so one, of course, one very um, well-known area of biomedical research is, of course, stem cell research. And here I don't just mean embryonic stem cell research. I mean stem cell research in general. Yeah, it's um, in the female breast. It's in fat. Yeah. yeah, stem cells come from a lot of places. That's right. And we're getting pretty good at manipulating cells so that they are the right sort of stem cell. Now, the reason why stem cells are important is because one of the changes that happen during, throughout life is that some of our tissue, in some of our tissues, especially some parts of the brain and also the heart and one or two other places, cells die and they are not naturally replaced by the division of other cells. So we have to help the body out by putting in new cells ourselves by medical treatments so as to maintain these various tissues. Well, that's just like if somebody, and they've seen some success, you, you probably know more about all the hundreds of studies, but you know, put, with somebody with Parkinson's, uh, you know, putting uh, brain cells, and, and they can now culture these, uh, in there, and then the body is absorbing them and using them. That's exactly right. Parkinson's disease turns out to be one of the easier applications of, of stem cell therapies because the part of the brain where the cells die is a very well-defined localized one. 
Okay, so then. But what's the, amazing is the brain is actually using the new cells. That's incredible. I mean, that's a. I mean, that's a big step towards what you're saying, isn't it? Oh yes, absolutely. And the reason why these things aren't so hard as they might look is because the the, the, the information that the cells need in order to know what to do um, when you put them into the brain is already encoded in those cells. As so long as they are more or less in the right state, they will take cues from their environment in just the same way, really, as the cells did when the brain was being built in the first place. It's like the, the rest way. of the brain is a drill sergeant that tells them line up? Or? Um, well, to, to, to an approximation, yes, that's right. Now, just simplification here, because this is complex stuff. We'll be right back with our guest over this quick break. Best-selling author, multiple doctorates. You can go read his bio if you've got five hours. Aubrey de Grey will be right back on the other side of this quick break. Infowars.com, prisonplanet.com are the websites. All right, we're going to talk about some of the genetic manipulation that's going on, some of the injection of stem cells, currently the treatments, and then what the research and, and you know, some of the advanced stuff that's on the horizon that's being developed. And then we'll talk about the social ramifications and even have some time near the end of this hour to take some calls with our guest at 1-800-259-9231. Uh, going back to Dr. Aubrey de Grey, uh, please continue. Okay, so one other area that's very, very important to combating aging and that is really moving forward very nicely is in the combating of one aspect of Alzheimer's disease. So Alzheimer's disease, as you may know, is a very complicated phenomenon in which, first of all, you have got cell death, very much like in Parkinson's disease, but more distributed around the brain. But also you've got the accumulation of various types of indigestible molecule inside the neurons and outside the neurons. And the stuff that accumulates outside the neurons, which is called phenyl plaques, is believed by a lot of people to be a really major player in the progression of Alzheimer's disease. So about 10 years ago, a trick was found in mice that such that you could actually vaccinate against this stuff. You could get certain cells in the brain called microglia to essentially swallow these chunks of material that were sitting around in the spaces between cells. And they would be able to destroy it once it was inside the cells. Um, so that treatment was so effective in mice that it's already moved to clinical trials, and the clinical trials are going very well. The phase three clinical trials, the final stage, has just begun. So that's going nicely. Uh, yeah. Other areas, other things that are being developed? Well, the, the ones I've mentioned so far are probably the ones that are furthest along. If we look at things that are not quite so far along but are still going pretty nicely, um, one example is um, the accumulation of really, really difficult to break down things that are inside cells already. For example, various um, uh, molecules similar to cholesterol that are inside cells in the wall of our arteries. Cholesterol itself is not really a harmful molecule because our cells know how to deal with it, but it gets spontaneously modified into forms that our cells don't know how to deal with. And those forms accumulate and eventually stop the cells in our artery walls from working, and that's where an atherosclerotic plaque comes from, that's where heart, uh, heart disease and heart attacks and strokes come from. So there's progress going on at, at the moment, actually a lot of it funded by my foundation, that is looking to identify bacteria in the soil that can break down these things and then to identify the genes that they have that allow them to break down these things. The idea here is that when we find those genes, we can modify them in some fairly obvious ways and introduce them into our own cells so as to give them a greater versatility in the range of things that they can break down. So that's a pretty ambitious idea. It'll take quite a long time to get to, to work, but when it does work, it'll be by far the most effective way to address uh, um, heart disease and also various other things like macular degeneration, for example, um, far more effective than anything we have today. Now, that's just one body of uh, science, isn't it, that fits in as a unit uh, into the larger plan that you've devised? That's right, yes. So my, I normally describe the, the range of things that need to be developed and done as breaking down into seven different categories. And so I just mentioned that atherosclerosis and macular degeneration are both within one category. That's because the general approach to fixing those two problems is broadly similar. It's not exactly similar. We have to find different enzymes to break down different target compounds, but the general approach to finding those enzymes is more or less the same. Now, 